Wheeler. We're here at the uh, Alexandria Mark Center campus of the Institute for Defense Analyses talking with General Larry Welch about the nuclear age and issues associated with it. Uh, we'll kind of resume the discussion that we had earlier on uh, the period when INF was signed and the Soviet attitudes toward it. One of the, uh, you, you had related the story about Marshall Akhmeyev bringing the map that showed the Soviet Union being surrounded by American forces. And from our point of view, these were all serving our interests or our allies' interests. From his point of view or his colleagues' point of view, they were basically containing the Soviet Union. One of the things that we and uh, the Soviets differed about from the earliest strategic arms talks was how you defined these systems. Yeah. They wanted to define a strategic system as anything that could strike Soviet soil. We wanted to define them basically as long-range systems. And we largely prevailed in a, a lot of ways on that. And so we kept them from, uh, we not only kept our allies out of the negotiations, they wanted to bring British for, and French forces in, uh, but we were able to keep our TAC air uh, that was deployed in theaters out of it. We were able to keep our carrier base there out of it. We were able to keep everything except the submarine ballistic missiles for our maritime forces out of it. Uh, th the, in a way, uh, they're not wrong, are they? No, you know, in, <coughs> in retrospect, uh, if we look at today, mm -hmm. you would almost wish that we had taken a different attitude. Mm -hmm. That is that if we had been a bit more allied oriented, Mm -hmm. But the reason, of course, that we focused on the long-range forces was because those were purely U.S. forces. Mm -hmm. And no one else had those kinds of forces. And plus, the Soviet counterpart was all that could reach us. Mm -hmm. So we tended to define strategic according to our own shores when we might have been a bit wiser to define strategic to include the interest of our allies, because mm -hmm. I think that our French and German and Polish and all of our other NATO allies, as well as our Japanese allies, mm -hmm. Koreans, uh, would tend to agree with the Russian definition of strategic. <laughs> and now, of course, we, the tables are a bit turned mm -hmm. in that, uh, that the Russians are now officially adopted what I call the NATO strategy. That is, they live in a tough neighborhood. Uh, they don't have the conventional, they don't think they have the mm -hmm. conventional forces to handle all the threats to the motherland, and therefore they need tactical nuclear weapons to deal with that. And hard to dismiss that since mm -hmm. that was the NATO strategy for 50 years. Mm -hmm. I would point out, though, that the Russians had a special attitude, the Soviets and the Russians, had a special attitude towards the French forced front, the French forces. Because mm -hmm. uh, the French didn't have this Cartesian approach to life they did, and they had, I don't know, a couple of squadrons of <laughs> airplanes and mm -hmm. 18 ICBMs and a couple of boats, more or less. But each of those 18 ICBMs could be targeted, or IRBMs, could be targeted against 100 targets. Mm -hmm. So they looked, and I had this in discussion with Russians later, they looked at the French as they could be covered 1,800 targets, and we don't know what they are, and we believe they will really do it. Mm -hmm. And it was that last sentence that made such a difference. But we might have been a bit wiser to, to have a bit wider consideration when we talked about what is strategic. Mm -hmm. Because it would be nonsense to argue that the French ballistic missiles and all the French forces weren't strategic in mm -hmm. the eyes of the Soviets. Mm -hmm. But uh, we ended up, we have a handful of non-strategic, mm -hmm. and 
they have a lot. <laughs> and we don't have a leg to stand on. Mm -hmm. the, uh, getting back to INF, uh, the treaty was signed in Washington in December 1987. And the following summer, uh, Marshal Akramayev and a group of his commanders came over with uh, General Secretary Gorbachev. Uh, what do you recall about that visit? Well, it was an interesting visit because Akhmayev brought with him the command of the rocket forces, mm -hmm. which is separate in Russia, mm -hmm. command of the Air Force, and the commander of the submarine forces. And <clears throat> I think to explain what this did to them mentally mm -hmm. is is probably best illustrated by Akhmayev's. I happened, we took Akhmayev and the others. We took them on aircraft carrier. We took them to an Air Force, tactical mm -hmm. Air Force base. Mm -hmm. uh, took them to an Army post. Uh, where Akhmayev really interacted with the troops. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was talking to this young F-16 crew chief at Cannon. And uh, he was, he was asking her questions, and he had a wonderful interpreter. You forgot that there was an interpreter. And they were, he was asking her questions, and she was answering with total confidence. Mm -hmm. She knew the answers. And finally, he turned to the pilot and said, you trust her? And he said, I trust her with my life every day. Well, remember, their crew chief would be a captain. Mm -hmm. Our crew chief was a three strike. So later on in a conversation with Akhmayev, uh, he said to me, he said, how do you do this? How can you have a young airman standing in front of the leader of the United States Air Force and the senior officer in the Soviet Union, and she is completely confident answers all the questions, has absolutely no fear. How do you do that? How do you create such a thing? And finally he said, it must come from growing up in America. Hmm. Uh, Admiral Crow took, took him to his uncle's house in Oklahoma City. Mm -hmm. And after that, he asked, Admiral Crow says, why aren't people flying flags and it's not uniform? The filling station has an American flag and they don't, and they do, and they don't. So why do they fly flags? And I'm across that because they want to. <laughs> and he just shook his head. And finally, with Hawker Mail, on the way back, I was on the Gulf Stream with him flying to New York. And he looked down and said, you know, uh, America's a land of houses. Mm -hmm. said, in Russia, we live in big apartment buildings in West Europe. And he said, I now know I've been lied to all my life. I've seen movies that show America in bread lines because they showed them the Depression movies. Mm -hmm. He said, and I have been taught always that Americans are selfish and all they care about is money and they're not patriotic. And he said, now I know that's not true. He said, I know you don't hate us. I've not encountered a single, a single example of, of animosity in all, every place we've been, universities, et cetera. He said, but I still believe that if you could, you would destroy us tomorrow morning. <laughs> so what that did is that it had this mixed effect. It gave him the impression that we're even a lot stronger than he thought we were. Mm -hmm. That we really don't hate him, but we would still coldly wipe them out if we could. There's one other thing. I, I took Maximov, commander of rocket forces to an actual launch control facility at Nob Noster. And uh, 
took him down in it with with his mm -hmm. two three stars and we had the typical crew on a six foot two ex academy football player and a, mm -hmm. about a five nine very attractive blonde woman and i told him you can answer any question i ask don't worry about classification just ask questions and when I got back up to him, he were really, they were really impressed with mm -hmm. this crew because mm -hmm. they were confident, they knew the answers. We got back up topside, we had little groups for him to talk to. You know, the people that maintain the facility, the people that load the warhead. Mm -hmm. About five little groups. He spent a lot of time with each one of them. He got through, he said, can I talk to your troops? Can I address your troops? I said, sure. He gave him a speech I should have given. He said, I am greatly comforted by the professional and commitment of your rocket forces because I believe it is the professionalism and the commitment of your rocket forces and my rocket forces that have kept the peace all of these years. And he wasn't just blowing smoke. Mm -hmm. He obviously truly believed that. Mm -hmm. So again, it was an interesting experience for us and them. Mm -hmm. uh, after that visit, I think Admiral Crowell had a very personal relationship with Dr. Mm -hmm. He was an admirable person. Mm -hmm. The tragic thing, of course, is he committed suicide yeah. several years ago, or several years later in the, the immediate aftermath of the failed coup against Gorbachev. Uh, there there's been a lot of speculation on what and why. The well, I can give you Admiral Crowell's take on it because mm -hmm. he knew him very well. Mm -hmm. We had seen Akamelf respond in New York to a question that seemed to question the commitment of the Red Army. Mm -hmm. And he responded quite angrily and said, we are not a banana republic. That the Soviet Army will support the legitimate Soviet government no matter what, just as your army will support your government no matter what. So Admiral Krauss' take is that he was so dismayed and felt like betrayed by the role of the army in that mm -hmm. attempted coup uh, that he just couldn't stand it. Because it was shortly after that that he committed suicide. Mm -hmm.